Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Trek Con with Sirach Lofton, of course. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and we are joined by visual effects producer on some little shows like Enterprise, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, you know, basically everything. Mr. Dan Curry. Oh, good morning. <laughs> Or after Round of the- applause. <laughs> we could have get. I could have kept going. Also, Chuck, Cult, Crisis, <laughs> Moonlight. I mean, it goes on forever. This is amazing. You've got an uh, an amazingly extensive uh, resume, Dan. No, thank you. Yeah, 118 features. Wow. 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 Yeah, uh, Dan, you're a legend in this business, and um, thank you for joining us. It's uh, it's good to see you again My after pleasure. all of these years. Okay, so Dan, can we just get into it? Before we hit record, you were telling us all this awesome stuff, and I don't want to waste any time not talking about all this great stuff. So let's just get <laughs> into it. You, you just already blew us away just a few minutes ago. You've got... Uh, You've got some footage of the main title sequence for Deep Space Nine that you'd like to share with us. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is practically an exclusive. This is really cool. First of all, thank you so much for joining us and for preparing for this. This is great. We are ready whenever you are. Okay, so uh, what do I do? Share screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want to do... Um, this is what visual effects producers do is create main title sequences, uh, all kinds of visual effects things too. I want to talk a bit more too about the gamut of everything that you do as a visual effects producer. Also, you didn't just do VFX as we know it but also art like you created uh, helped create the the batleth the mechleth right klingon weapons things like that so we'll be talking about that as well it's just unbelievable oh and while you're doing that we've got a few seconds here to show this off would you look at this Ah. giant thing I'm trying to find the artistry uh, of Dan Curry. This is Dan Curry's book, everybody. And there's just so much good stuff in it. And look how giant and thick this is. This is how much work this guy has put in. For example, look at all these things. Wow. What am I looking at right there? What is that? Uh, that is called block. the Darcy Archive. This is Kazon ships from Voyager. I mean, it's just a gigantic book with Dan Curry's artistry here. Uh, we've got the Vidian ship. And this book was just published uh, t- less than two years ago, right, Dan? Uh, yeah, it came out in December 2020. Mm, so just a little bit more than one year ago. Explosions, visual and special effects. Captain Proton on fire. Look at this. Yeah, when I designed the Captain Proton ship, I did the Buster <laughs> Crab Flash Gordon ship from memory, knowing that would be a little off because I hadn't seen it since I was about 10. And uh, that's how that ship came into existence. Wow. Yeah, this book is very big and very detailed. Um, Dan, do you ever get around to doing um, uh, in-person conventions around the world? I'm never invited. Well, you that's, are right now. That's crazy. Yeah, that's... that's uh, you, I do a lot of uh, stuff with other venues, like I just finished one with Oxford uh, University in England. Oh, okay. Oh, my Oxford goodness. University. Next generation fans just a, will recognize Just a this. little university called Oxford, ladies and gentlemen. 
Isn't wow, that, what is that? And like first season Next Generation that flew around that Tasha and Data were shooting at? Is that what that was? Uh, yeah, and uh, originally they uh, designed this 80-pound claw that kept snagging on the jungle set. So at the last minute, the producers came to me and said, come up with something. So I took a plastic Easter egg, a shampoo bottle, and a legs pantyhose container and made an airbrush <laughs> made that robot. And uh, instead of doing motion control, uh, having done Tai Chi for, for years, I did all the motion by hand and everybody thought I was nuts till they saw it. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that too. Um, you know, cause I, I, I heard about your martial uh, arts prowess and, and how that really had a lot to do with the whole Klingon fighting style. I just maybe can get into a little bit of that. Yeah, uh, what happened is I, um, uh, after college, I volunteered for the Peace Corps and built small dams and bridges on tributaries of the Mekong River in Northeast Thailand. And each village had its own kind of secret martial arts style. And I started getting into martial arts with the local guys and then wound up studying it for another five years carefully and uh, had some great teachers, great dagger teachers. And uh, so when a, an episode of Next Generation came along where Worf was to inherit some bladed weapon, what happened was uh, the art department sent down something that looked like a pirate's cutlass. And I'd been imagining a weapon for years, but I uh, had no reason to make one. And I made one out of foam core and said, we should do something for the Klingons that's unique but ergonomically sound, not kind of a fake movie weapon. And uh, so I showed it to the producers and stunt coordinator Dennis Madalone. And yeah. uh, as usual, our, our executive producer said, if it was two inches shorter, I could accept it. And uh, De Dennis at first didn't like it. And then he became a, an evangelist. And here is that left number one. Nice. Wow, that's the first bat lift ever designed. Built in cloaking uh, device. Yeah, that's it. And uh, let me get rid of uh, my... right, what, what is the what is the grip rip uh, wrapped with on that? Uh, on these that are one? the grip is wrapped with leather. Okay. And uh, then when Michael signed on to Deep Space Nine. That, that sounds like it's a real one. That yeah, sounds heavy. Like <laughs> that looks like it'll really take your head off if you <laughs> handle it. Uh, yeah. Let me do this. I'm going to turn <laughs> off my virtual background so you can see better. Um, okay. So here's my disgustingly busy uh, uh, <laughs> office here. Uh, but uh, so this will, it, it's a little easier than compositing. So here it is. And when Michael signed on to Deep Space Nine, he uh, I got this funny phone call. Daniel, I need a new weapon. And uh, he explained he wanted something small enough that he could hide behind his back, but uh, effective enough that it could take on a bat left. Wait, and that so call came from, act from Michael Dorn, actually, not one of the uh, writers? No, from Michael himself. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, we're good friends. At any rate, um, so Michael came over to my house, and I showed him a collection of weapons I brought back from Asia. So I showed him this, which is wow. a, yeah. uh, I obtained this in Western Nepal, and this is a uh, Nepalese Kora sword, and it's designed to be, unlike Western sabers, which are curved upwards, this is turd, curved down, which can lop off an opponent's appendage uh, wherever you might strike. And so I showed that to Michael and I said, why don't we use the tip of that? And so we spent a little time fooling around with shapes. And this is the very first mechlith made out of cardboard, uh, reinforced with popsicle sticks. And uh, <laughs> we went out in my backyard and fooled around with it and had a batleth and a mechleth and uh, this mechleth and some spears. And we fooled around with it. And I wanted something you could use backhand. Uh, and so that when you block an opponent's weapon, 
it his weapon will glide off and away from mm -hmm. you, and you can uh, throw it like a hatchet. You can use it forehand, backhand, and then each surface is a cutting surface. So if you're very close to your opponent, you can do serious damage with the the back ends. So that was uh, uh, the original one, and then wow. using a metal one, and and when they used it for actual stunts. We had a, a rubber version with a steel core so that the actors wouldn't really destroy each other. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you have a very good understanding of physics and ergonomics, because when I'm looking at what you're designing and when you're explaining it, there, there's, you're not just looking for something that looks good. You're trying to conceptualize something that realistically it is based in science is based in functionality and it's just really cool to see because like i'm watching you do this and i'm thinking like oh yeah that totally works you know and it totally makes sense and of course klingons don't want something that's just going to slide off somebody they want something that's going to hack off a limb they want something that's that's made for for hacking and for slicing uh, so and I even as a kid I could always spot movie weapons that were designed yeah. to look cool but were not really functional and so uh, that's why this came into existence. Um, are you forging the, the these uh, pieces are directly out of the metal or uh, uh, no? They go to the prop department and and they make them. And, okay. Uh, and uh, I used to live next door to Roxanne Dawson. Oh. And uh, uh, so we both had rubber bat lefts so for her <laughs> bat <-less> training. <laughs> um, I also see the, a similar kind of bat lift design in the Deep Space Nine architecture, mm -hmm. kind of in that, you know, the columns of, of the DS9 mm. structure has the same curvature almost and almost like they're um uh, designed in the same way uh i that was a pure coincidence <laughs> <laughs> did you have any part of designing that uh no and that's why it came mm -hmm. from the art department and it was built by the the hero models were built by the great uh model maker tony mininger and we had the hero model which was about six feet in diameter and then we had um a uh a half model without the center so that when we're inside looking out the window, you would see the layers of the rings yeah. of the station beyond you. So that we used the half model for those shots. Wow. Mm. So when, wow. so when Michael Dorn, I, sorry, I'm still kind of obsessed with this. When Michael <laughs> Dorn saw what you had come up with, with the Mechleth, was he immediately sold on it? Or yeah. did you or did you have to kind of explain how you came well, up with it and why? And then he kind of came around to it. Well, he was with me. And so we collaborated and did it together. Wow. And uh, it was uh, approved by the producers with no changes whatsoever. Oh. And the, the Batleth, uh, the Navy Department of Research actually sent somebody to talk to me about bladed weapon ergonomics. And the Korean Martial Arts Association approved it as the uh, first new uh, weapon in the last 200 years that had practical value. What? Yeah. Really? That's so cool. You're like actually officially wow. recognized then. Uh, well, I, I guess you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you did. <laughs> I, I think it's That's interesting amazing. too that, that, that Michael Dorn would actually like request this kind of thing. Cause I don't, I don't re recall anybody else that I can think of that like asking for a, uh, you know, a prop or, or something to that degree. That's pretty interesting that the idea of it kind of was born out of this conversation between the two of you. Yeah. Did, well, did, we, uh, did Armin actually say, I want like a whip that has a laser <laughs> coming out of how many different ways can I kill someone <laughs> with one weapon? And when I come up with those, that's a Klingon weapon. <laughs> yeah, well, even a bottle cap could do the job if you know how to use it. <laughs>
Yeah, don't mess with Dan, guys. If you ever run into him on the streets, uh, you might think that this uh, gray-haired guy is, uh, you know, somebody you can mess with, and then and then you, you might have too many problems on your hand. He's uh, clearly uh, knows what he's doing when it comes to weaponry and martial arts, and mm-hmm. uh, I, I think it's amazing, uh, Dan, that you know your mind is so brilliant and that you're able to come up with so many really original things. You know, um, a lot of a lot of the blades and swords haven't changed much over years. It takes, you know, you have different, obviously you've studied this kind of thing. So you, you've seen those kinds of changes between uh, areas, different, different uh, regions having different kinds of blades and different forgings of different kinds of steel to make them more solid and more, um, you know, battle worthy. Mm. I had a a great dagger teacher in Laos who used to take us down to the market, and he had a friend who had a restaurant, and we'd go down with uh, with the, the, the um, weapons and and cut up the sides of beef so that we'd get a feel for how a blade root moves through meat without snagging. Mm-hmm. You know, Sirak, when you were saying your mind is so, I was like, say sharp, say sharp, but it's okay. Brilliant works too. <laughs> really. uh, wow. So that's really cool. So Dan, are you trained in, in martial arts? Uh, yeah, actually yeah, I am. Seems that way. Yeah. What have you taken? Uh, well, I studied originally in, in Thai villages uh, and uh, with their, and each village had its own master. And it was like something that for generations they kept uh, then I got to study with a sword teacher in Bangkok named Tang Chan. I got to teach, uh, learn with a dagger teacher in Laos. And I got to study Taekwondo with a guy rated number five in Korea. And I worked, studied with him for years and got a, a black belt in Taekwondo. Wow. And but most of the stuff that I studied uh, was with, you know, unlike the... Uh, uh, the schools here, they're very small, just a few students. And uh, one, uh, my dagger teacher in Laos was so serious about his uh, subject area that he said, uh, when I got to a certain level, he said, uh, you'll have to accept the fact that if I judge that you've mistreated, misused what I'm teaching you, uh, I will kill you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but then wouldn't he be missed? using it what oh who knows? <laughs> it was his prerogative maybe you're right I trusted him implicitly. yeah that's his prerogative wow okay wow. you you've dropped a lot of cool stuff so far we did get sidetracked though because when you start talking weapons with Sirak and myself we get very excited but were we able to pull up the uh main title sequence uh, uh for deep space yeah. nine now it's doing something. Hang on, I got the little. Here we go. Let's see what happens. All right, we got it. Very good. Okay. Nice. We Let's see everything. Go. All right, let me go back one slide. Here's mm-hmm. the animatic. Wow. Got all your old notes in there as well. Yeah. Now I'm trying to go back to the title sequence. Okay. And I can get rid of this and let's try it. Okay. Here's, here it is. And now I'll show you the rough animatic. And this one, uh, before we start, uh, I went down to image G, which was our motion control stage. And they uh, were working with a a plywood mock-up because the hero model was still under construction. So I went down with my colleague, Eddie Williams, and we both kind of walked around the station and I decided to do a a crude handheld version to show the producers what I had in mind. This is that. Wait, before you do that, Dan, 
I want to mm-hmm. make sure that when you shared the screen, did you make sure to click again, um, optimize for video and share sound? Because let's try to do that again, because this, well, this one has no sound, so it doesn't matter. OK, cool. So. So here I just. Uh, put a piece of acetate in front of the lens to make a glow. And these are just different clips of the uh, of the plywood mock-up space station, which we needed to build a rig to move the model around because the model is so big. And then in the edit bed, we just slapped this together and you can see the crude mock-up. Yeah. And so I did all these uh, camera moves by hand. Really? It's very smooth. Were you uh were you using and then, and then you, add, and then you yeah. 20 years of Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't using a rig like a steady cam rig? No, handheld just holding it in my hands. Wow, amazing. Wow. And and then you you go in and add all the details afterwards? Is that uh, no, uh, we, then we reshot it when I had approval from the producers on the oh. Inexcuse Motion Control Rig with the Hero model. So this was just to give a general idea of what the sequence would look like. That's amazing. This is a piece of Star Trek history right here. Yeah, this is like before it happened. Yeah, and you recognize these shots, Ciroc? And the, uh, uh, I definitely do, like especially the opening shots. And, uh, oh, yeah. and here's oh, there's a wormhole. Wave, <laughs> uh, and he's waving <laughs> a, a, a flag with uh, white tape on it to simulate the wormhole. Wow. <laughs> and so here, and then when uh, after season three, the original intent of the title sequence was "We're alone out there," and to suggest the remoteness of Deep Space Nine, thus the name. And after yeah. a few seasons, Deep Space Nine became the hub of activity. So Dennis McCarthy re-recorded the, the main title theme to be a little bit more upbeat. And so here are the uh, storyboards I drew to uh, accommodate the, the uh, sense that it's busier so you can see more ships docked at the different pylons. And these are just... I probably would devote maybe two, three minutes per frame to do these drawings. And here's wow. showing how a dock ship would sweep by the lens. Mm-hmm. And uh, John Knoll, who uh, went on to uh, invent Photoshop with his brother Thomas and uh, run ILM now, uh, John uh, did the space bend for us. And, you mean... Uh, um... The guy who just invented Photoshop, that guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know the guy, that guy, yeah. <laughs> head of industrial light and magic, you know, my buddy. That's great, man. You definitely, I mean, it's just amazing the amount of um, the work that goes in be- before the work that we actually see, yeah. like, you know, the amount of preparation and, um, <sighs> crazy i didn't didn't realize this is a a a really crude model of the uh, our motion control rig at mhg and you can see that the camera runs back and forth on tracks it could go up and down on the tower and it could go east west so all motion is generated by the movement of the camera and the model in this case the deep space nine uh, can roll pitch and yaw and that way we only have to light one spot uh, where if we had the model move, then you'd have to make a much more elaborate lighting rig. And here's the actual motion control rig at MHG. And you can see that it's pretty complicated with, uh, by today's standards, Neolithic computers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Neolithic. <laughs> and when we shot uh, uh, models to get the mat pass or its silhouette, which was used to make a hole in the background to put the model in. We originally used white cards, which were problematic because they each 
each card would be at a different angle to the lens and have a different density and make pulling an even mat uh, difficult. And so uh, the late Gary Hutzel came up with the idea of using ultraviolet light and orange screen, and it made everything much more even and saved us an immense amount of time. Hang on, and hang on. Sorry, one second. Orange screen, how did that, without without getting it too complicated for uh, people like me that would have no idea what you're talking about, what what difference did that make and, and why compared well, to like or blue orange, or green? Okay, because well, Dayglow orange uh, glows with an even luminosity when you hit it with ultraviolet light. And so it gave us a more perfectly even uh, black and white when we did our final uh, transfers to Hikon. And so that's why the orange screen, because it, it glows uh, more evenly. It doesn't matter what angle the ultraviolet light is hitting it at. It just glows evenly all, all over the frame. Wow. And here's how we shot the stars. We made a, uh, a cyclorama of uh, white milk plexiglass and then painted it black inside and using push pins, uh, Gary Hutzel primarily and, and a few other guys would go in and uh, just scratch the paint off. And by putting lights on the outside, we would use the same uh, pan tilt information that we used in the model shot, but without the track information. And that's why the stars synced correctly with the camera move of the model. So you weren't poking holes through that, you were just scratching the paint off and the light right, was creeping through it. Right, because the white plex would make yeah. it glow better. If we did holes, then you'd get little beams of light coming through. Yeah. It wouldn't look as good. Wow, and you really? and you cur and you curved it for for what purpose? So, uh, so that the camera, when it does pan and tilt, uh, it's got a background. So that way, it creates the illusion that you're surrounded by stars mm -hmm. in space. Uh, but where if it was flat, it would, once you got off axis, the stars would disappear. Mm -hmm. This is brilliant. How big was that, uh, that, that uh, star panel, uh, plexiglass panel? It was a four by eight sheet of plexiglass. That's it, huh? Just to, enough to basically surround the camera. That's correct. Mm. And then we dra draped black cloth over it so that it would be light proof. So the mm -hmm. only light would be the light from the stars. And just another note that might be of interest, in order to create the illusion that an explosion happened in zero gravity, we would shoot straight up uh, with a photosonics camera that could shoot at 360 frames a second. And by shooting straight up, all the ejecta from the explosion would uh, would arc out evenly and you couldn't tell that gravity was pulling it down, where if you shot the explosion horizontally, the shards yeah. of ejecta would fall and you'd know it was not happening in space. It would be bogus. Right. So this is, and so this would be typical of blowing up a, a Klingon ship. And there's visual effects supervisor Glenn Neufeld in the fore, foreground, and we're rigging it too. And here's a case where special effects and visual effects work together to accomplish something. So, and, so you're actually you're actually blowing you're actually blowing up these tiny models. <laughs> that is yeah. correct. And, hanging, and every time we're hanging, seeing it blown yeah. up, we're actually looking up at it. Exactly. Otherwise, it would look it would look fake. Yeah. And so here's a, a little a deep space line uh, space battle, and this is a hybrid technology. As we started to use computer generated images but we didn't quite trust them yet. So this sequence, I think it's from Sacrifice of Angels, is a hybrid uh, technology where the foreground ships that are highly detailed are physical models, but we wouldn't, it would take a day just to do a simple shot of a flyby. So we wouldn't have had time to shoot all these ships and get make our air date. So the background ships are CG, but the detailed foreground ships are um, our uh, uh, physical models, and you can take a look at this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's done with the green screen, uh, or orange screen. Orange screen. 
And so here's I've never, I've never heard of Orange Springs. Me neither. Yeah. It gives me brand new stuff here. <laughs> and so here's uh, so the small ships in the distance are CG, but while the foreground ships are physical models. Yeah, you really can't tell the difference. Oh, well, uh, we assume that your the eye will go to the foreground ship, yeah. and notice the force field on Deep Space Nine. Okay, that little sparkly thing. Yeah, uh, I'm going to show you what that is next. And that's it. So we're going to. Go away. Now, can you, did I disappear? Uh, no, we still see your screen. And you see can your see screen. I yeah. can see you with a whole bunch of Emmys over there. Yeah. Well nice, deserved Nice Emmys. set of trophies. Uh, <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Well, at, at any rate, um, here is the actual force field uh, around Deep Space Nine and the Enterprise. Oh, if you're going to be showing us this, then hit uh, stop share screen so that that way we can see you okay. and, and not your screen at the top. Okay, well, I've kind of lost my. <laughs> uh, God, and that, you're going to have to edit something. There we go. I stopped uh, it. Okay, very good. We see you just fine. Here's the force field around the Enterprise and uh, Deep Space Nine. And what it is, it's a cheerleader's pom pom, and <laughs> I was looking for something in a in a dry goods store, and uh, I happened to see this pom pom, and I said, "Well," and I shook it, and I said, "That has lots of interesting random light and and sparkles." So I uh, set up a mirror at a forty five degree angle, and Gary Hutzel shot it with an old Mitchell camera, and I just shook it over here overhead, and we've used that technique for a lot of different things including really all uh light creatures where I, I just put this on a stick and with hand animate little fluttery energy creatures and by throwing it out of focus it made it look like this amorphous energy amoeba <laughs> uh that's i can't i can't believe it yeah i can't believe the force field like I'm trying to picture because I, I recognize the colors and the shimmery nature of the force field and what you're showing us just now, but I'm trying to picture actually a night, a 45 degree angle. And I'm like, but when I'm looking at it, I'm seeing a force field. I'm not seeing a pom pom. <laughs> well, and, uh, uh, well, the fact that we would take, take the flat frame of the pom pom and wrap it around a virtual sphere so that it would look like and for the enterprise it was right. more mm shaped that we squeezed it north mm -hmm. north south and uh, that was um, a, a way we could use what we call organic elements and make them uh, uh, make them look spherical or whatever or even put clouds on a planet that's how we would do that sometimes we'd even take talcum powder and splash it on black cardboard and uh, then throw it a little bit out of focus and that would be a weather system on a planet wow uh, so creative Dan, uh, you know you're just making you're basically making stuff up and like it makes me wonder like how do you learn like what do you what do you study to be able to have these kinds of <laughs> skill sets? Like it's like yeah, there are no uh, classes you know. that teach you this. You're the one teaching us classes right now, right? Uh, you well, just we, we made it up as we went along. Uh, yeah, uh, despair is the mother of creation. I guess you know we had these air <laughs> dates. And we had to figure out how to do things like liquid nitrogen was one of our best friends, um, and I think it was from playing with toys as a little kid. Uh, when I played with them, I never thought about them as toys. I was always my eye was a camera, and I was always making little movies with the toys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think uh, that's uh, that's where that comes from. Is just uh, this kind of playful attitude and the ability to see things independent of their original purpose and uh, independent of their scale. What? Yeah. What was the the creation, the Dan Curry creation? You know, like like the pom pom is now 
representing a force field. What, what was your Dan Curry creation that you're most proud of the creativity of it, of kind of like pulling, pulling an idea out of nowhere that just came out so well? Uh, I think that was weekly. Um, um, <laughs> we, uh, for the one for the finale of uh, Next Generation, we had to show Primordial Earth with all these lava fields. Right. And working with uh, Supervisor David Stipes and uh, a great model maker, um, um, Tony Dublin, uh, we made this big model of, of crunkled aluminum foil uh, for rock formations in primordial earth and on a plexiglass table. And we filled it with methicil, which is a viscous substance made out of vegetable material that McDonald's uses to thicken milkshakes, but it has the consistency of mucus. And we, mm. by sprinkling burnt cork and uh, vermiculite <laughs> on it and lighting it from the bottom, it looks like bottom lit lava going down a tube. And one of the yeah. funniest like, things. Well, how do you know? Like, how, I know. Where does he come up with this? <laughs> yeah. Where do you come up with this stuff? It's like, I, I feel like I would have loved to just like watch you guys work just to be, it would have been like, you know, uh, like a fun thing to do. It's like basically, Hey, how do we do this? I don't know. Let's get some pom poms and yeah. vermicite uh, mucus. And- <laughs> <laughs> you know, that yeah, stuff, know. it does this, it does that. People are like, I have no idea what that is, but okay. Yeah. Well, there was one shot in, uh, in Arsenal of Freedom for TNG where we needed an invisible spaceship to be detected by its heat signature as it entered the atmosphere of a planet. So how we did that, uh, we didn't have CG at the time. So what we uh, so I made a model, covered it with black velvet, and glued slivers of white plastic bag on it, and set it on the motion control rig surrounded by electric fans. And by shooting it, by keeping this sh- the uh, shuttle the shutter open for three seconds of frame, the flapping plastic created motion blur, and it looked like hot gases. And then I burnt a newspaper in an old barbecue, keyed that through the flapping plastic, and it looked like the heat. Uh, re-entry signature of a of a capsule coming into an atmosphere. So has anybody ever called you the MacGyver of visual effects or what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah a couple of guys on set called me that. Yeah, very yeah. much so, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, That's well, number, yeah. I earned that reputation. We were on location. We had a, a prop spear and the spear broke and uh, and we didn't have the means to fix it. So I took a couple of popsicle sticks, uh, put it back together and took a bag that Cheetos came in, turned it inside out so the silver mylar was outside, wrapped it around, and we used that prop like that for several episodes. What? And, <laughs> uh, I need a Cheetos bag yeah, some I know. and some, uh, some glue. <laughs> yeah, and you there, you're chewing gum. Give me that. What is it, bubble? Okay, perfect. Bubble gum, yes. <laughs> well, here, here's the funniest one. Uh, uh, we had an episode where we needed a brown mottled mining planet. And I had satellite shots that NASA gave us, I had paintings, I had macro shots of rocks in my garden. And uh, I didn't like any of them. And we were using something very primitive by today's standards called the Sony System G that could take a flat image and wrap it around the virtual sphere. Mm. And uh, so uh, my colleague, uh, went in the back and threaded up a negative on the machine, and I saw it wrapped. And I said, "Yeah, that's really good. That brown model that that works well." And uh, so I said, "What is that?" And he said, "I'm not going to tell you." So I told the editor to unwrap it. Let me take a look at it. And you know, if you took toothpaste and you put your hand on it and pick, picked it up, there'd be little spiky formations. Yeah. And so I noticed that, and I began to discern kernels of undigested corn and the nike logo from the sole of a sneaker and he admitted he was getting out of his car and planted his foot in something that had been alpo 25 24 hours earlier yeah and in a a desperate attempt to turn a bad situation into good he took a macro shot of it and uh (laughs) 
And I didn't care what it really was. I cared what it looked like. And I said, well, put some clouds on top. It'll be great. And we used that as an episode in uh, seven, uh, as a planet in seven episodes. We nicknamed it Ficus Canis. Oh, very good. Ficus Canis. <laughs> very, uh, very Latin. Uh, so wait, you're telling me that sometimes corn kernels don't get fully digested? Um it depends on the uh, <laughs> uh, on the, uh, <laughs> the gut bacteria in the dog. Right. No. Oh all, my goodness. That's what, uh, I have a what series. About, sorry, just uh, real quick. What series was that? Use that that TNG. planet. TNG. TNG. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Sirach. Wow. Ficus canis. Yeah. Talk about a an s hole country. Uh, hey. But I wanted to say. Uh, what about the the warp speed and 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 that whole effect of of that? Do you have any insight on that? So, uh, well, to create the stretch ship, you mean? Yes. Uh, that's yeah. slit scan photography, and slit scan is really complicated. It was perfected by uh, Douglas Trumbull, who just passed away a couple of days ago, uh, mm. and Doug uh, was famous for two thousand and one Blade Runner, you know, a couple of little movies like that, and yeah. Uh, and, and uh, what you do is you put a piece of cardboard in front of the camera lens on a motion control tiny uh, motor, and it, it photographs whatever you're doing through this moving slit so that if you move the model and the slit at the same time, you can change the proportions of the model depending on how much one moves. And, uh, and so that was accomplished with slit, slit scan. Uh, photography the same as the warp stars were done that way too Sirach now I don't know about you okay but when we ask Dan a question I feel like uh, he's so smart and creative that I only understand half of what he's saying <laughs> like he I know he's explaining it perfectly but I'm like, I'm still trying to understand the first half of what he said and he's already finished <laughs> I'm like I'm like Man, I, it, I'm just blown away, uh, Dan, not just by your creativity. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so inarticulate. I, I'm not explaining it clearly. No, it's it's the opposite. It's that you yeah. you have done such a good job with these things that it's it's basically beyond, you know, personally, my comprehension until I've been walked through all of these steps or taken whatever classes you took or 17 years of Tai Chi in Laos. I don't know what, what it is, but you operate on a level that's just so creative and amazing. It's, it's really impressive. Well, it's just stumbling from one thing to another. Did any one of the shows of the shows that you worked on Star Trek wise, uh, give present any more difficult challenges than, than the other, or were they all just like, you know, well, each one had its own personality, um, and uh, CG became more viable as a technology over the course of time. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started Next Generation, it was very primitive by by the standards we had on Enterprise, which was the first all CG show. Yeah, yeah. And Enterprise yeah. never had a, a had a physical model. Wow. Well, and so the transition probably was probably the time in which you had to do the most work, I would imagine, because you're having to, comp having to you're trying to bridge the two. And having to keep up with things. And our biggest enemy was time because we uh, just had so much to shoot. And we were doing 80 hour weeks sometimes like the finale of deep space nine. We had 354 shots to turn around in three weeks, including major space battles, uh, huge match shots in inside uh, the Bajoran caves. And on, on a trip to Ireland, I took a lot of photography in Mizzenhead, and they became the cliffs of the Bajoran uh, fire caves. Ooh. And Dan, can you start back? back as we, we, we get it. <laughs> I don't think we can get all of this. There's, there's too much to cover, Dan. I hope you'd come back and join us. This is, <laughs> this is like so educational. There Here's he a is. Kardashian um, uh, communicator, and uh, the art department slipped me in as a deceased, uh, crazy um, 
uh, mad scientist. <laughs> mad scientist is perfect. How, how'd they come up with that? <laughs> no, but Sirach took the words right out of my mouth. We are, we're out of time. And I feel like we've just scratched the surface on all of the questions we have for you. And every time you answer a question, five more questions pop in my head about <laughs> where did you come up yeah. with this? How did this happen? How did that happen? I mean, this is this is Star Trek history here, Dan, and we're just elated that you came by. Thank you. I feel like we're playing here. This is so much fun. Will you please come back and share more goodies with us sometime? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And next time I'll talk about uh, uh, using the same uh, uh, sense of ergonomics to design guitars. Guitars. Uh, that's... Wow. that's we got to have you back, Dan. There's too much to cover. <laughs> we got to have you back. Please come back yeah. and, and talk with us some more. Um, it's just it's such a pleasure to talk to somebody who has such a wealth of information and literally pioneered an entire uh, craft. So what an honor, um, Dan. Well, uh, I'd like to say one, one thing that's really important, um, and that is uh, there's no single hero of Star Trek visual effects it's a team of people and with yeah. a wide range of skill sets. Uh, so there's, you know, Rob Legato, Gary Hutzel, David Stipes, Glenn Neufeld, Mitch Suskin, uh, the team at Image G, the compositors, the animators. So we probably had sometimes 80 people working on, on the show. So I, any awards we got or anything that we, we accomplished was the result of, um, of that many people working collaboratively toward, collaboratively toward a common goal. Mm -hmm. Also, another thing that's important to mention, and that's absolutely valuable what you did mention. Thank you, Dan. This book, okay, uh, can you tell everybody where they can find this uh, new book online? Because I've just had the time of my life looking through this. Well, it's available on Amazon. I think it's 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll kiss 25 bucks goodbye. Goodbye. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Well, what's uh, the title? Right. Yeah, it's called The Artistry what's of the Dan of Curry. It should be called The Wizardry of Dan Curry, The Magic well, of Dan Curry. But it's The Artistry of Dan Curry. Uh, look it up on Amazon and, hey, buy it. It, it makes a great gift. And you're going to be supporting somebody that put in his heart and soul and MacGyver imagination into all these iconic ships and planets and weapons that we all kind of forget that there's some mad scientist behind these creating these things that we've known our whole lives. So definitely check that out and show some support. And, and everybody out there, I don't know about you guys, but I, I want a Dan Curry autograph. So I, yeah. I'd love to see the convention one of these days, because I'd love to, to, to stand in line and get your autograph. Well, I, 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 I want to get an autograph. I, I, but we can uh, we can set that up. We're both in L.A. Just to uh, oh. give me a time and place. We'll get together. Mm -hmm. Ryan, you want one, too? I can tell. I can see. You can I want my book autograph. <laughs> I was already thinking. I was like, I was like, yeah, Rock might get a ball autograph, but I'm going to get that book autograph. No, Dan, Dan, you're a legend. And, you know, we really. We all appreciate the work that you put in because you know your signature and the men the, the your the fellow people that you mentioned that worked alongside you. Mm -hmm. All of you guys collaboratively brought us so much joy and made everything look so real and um, allowed our imagination to wander because of the you know the level of authenticity that you gave us. So thank you so much for all the work you put in, all of you guys here. Uh, there's not enough Emmys in the world that can uh, add up to the amount of change and hope and, and and impact that you made in the world. So, you know, that's it's it's a pleasure. Well, uh, it's my pleasure, and and thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, here's my ooh, <laughs> there it is, yeah. there it is. Wow, and that's one of my guitars in the background there. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, okay. we will definitely be in contact. Um, and let me know if you want me to sign the book. I'll, we can arrange to uh, to do that somewhere. Fantastic.
Really appreciate it. Yes. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. It's, it was it was fun to reminisce about all this stuff. Absolutely. It was. Good to see you again, Shira. Oh, you too, Dan. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing your your experience with us and enlightening us about all the work that you put in. Mm-hmm. And everybody at home, go to Amazon right now. Get that book, and uh, hey, send out a tweet. Go go tweet out. Say, oh my god, I never realized how awesome Dan Curry is. Check him out right now. Say something because this is this is great stuff. We really appreciate you, Dan. We'll see you again soon. We hope. And everybody at home, thank you very much for joining us. And we will see you next time. There it is. <laughs>